Mr. Vivek Call. Indoor Management Association is proud to host the eminent writer Mr. Vivek Call today. He is the renowned author of Easy Money Trilogy. The trilogy is based on the history and evolution of money and what led to the current financial crisis. The first two books in the trilogy were bestsellers on Amazon and the third book is scheduled to appear early this year. Mr. Vivek Call is a writer who has worked at senior positions with many newspapers, mainly DNA and the Economic Times. His writings also appeared in the Times of India, Business Standard, Business Today, The Hindu, Indian Management, The Asian Age, Deccan Chronicle, Forbes India, Mutual Fund Insight, The Free Press Journal and Wealth Insight. His areas of interest are the intersection between politics and economics, the international financial crisis, personal finance, marketing and branding, and anything to do with cinema and music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Vivek Call to enrich our minds with his wisdom and words. You know, over the last uh, two days, you've heard some brilliant individuals recounting some really nice stories. Uh, my problem is, uh, you know, I'm a writer and I'm still single and my stories are a little too scandalous to be kind of recounted uh, in the public domain. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm, uh, so I'll stick to what I know best and none of it is uh, out of my own experience. This is, uh, you know, something that I've read and analyzed and understood and written about over the years. Uh, you know, this time, uh, rather interestingly, the Cricket World Cup uh, starts uh, on, uh, on Valentine's Day. And uh, in cricket, uh, they say that it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Uh, but we are Indians, so we need to talk about something else. And uh, so I wanted to start this uh, presentation with a question. So how many of you here uh, have heard about this former bus conductor called Shivaji Rao Gaikwad? Yes, so who's he? Ah, okay. I mean, I am, I'm sure. So Rajini Kant uh, is, is uh, Shivaji Rao Gaikwad, and he is basically, you know, very well known for his uh, on-screen mannerisms as well as dialogues. And one of his most famous dialogues, which I think was from the movie Pade Appa, uh, and when translated into English was, uh, I, may be the, I may be late, but I am the latest. So I kind of find myself in, in a... <laughs> in a very uh, funny situation where uh, I have to, you know, I'm the last speaker for the day after so many great speakers have spoken before me. Uh, so let's start this. So this presentation is essentially called Easy Money, What Happens Next? And to give you some sort of a background, uh, I started working on a book uh, sometime in October 2011 on the history of uh, money and how that has caused the current financial crisis. Uh, ultimately, it became a very big book and my publisher suggested, he was kind enough to say that uh, let's divide it into three parts and that became the Easy Money Trilogy, which you kind of heard about uh, in the introduction. Uh, two books are out, the third one comes out later this month at the Delhi Book Fair on February 21st. Uh, in this presentation, I essentially try to take the story forward uh, beyond what I have uh, kind of discussed in my three books and uh, try and look at what, uh, you know, how this current financial crisis will evolve, how will that impact the world at large and India in particular. But uh, there's a disclaimer that I want to make at the very beginning because I'll be making some forecasts and predictions. So it is tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So we have to kind of, you know, so I, I would request you to look at my presentation with this disclaimer in mind. Uh, so before we, uh, you know, kind of get to the meat of the topic, it's important that I uh, just give you some sort of a basic background. I mean, I'm sure people here would be aware of it, but uh, there's no harm in kind of uh, repeating a little bit of it. So Lehman Brothers, uh, which was the fourth largest uh, investment bank on Wall Street, went bust on September 15, 2008. Uh, a week before that, the American government had rescued two financial institutions called uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They had been nationalized. 
A day later, uh, American Insurance Group, which is, or rather, which still is the biggest insurance company in the world, was nationalized by the U.S. government. So, long story short, uh, the U.S. was in major trouble, and its economy uh, obviously got into major trouble after this. Uh, given that, uh, you know, when when economies get into trouble, central banks have to come to the rescue. And uh, two months and ten days later, the Federal Reserve of United States essentially announced that it would be buying bonds worth $600 billion. Now, the uh, bonds, as you would understand, are uh, financial securities issued by either the government or private sector when they want to raise money. Uh, something of an equivalent of a fixed deposit issued by a bank. Now, the question is, where did Federal Reserve get this money from? I mean, $600 billion is not small change. I mean, it's almost one-third India's GDP, India's current GDP, that is. And uh, obviously, you know, any central bank doesn't have any money of its own. So the Federal Reserve simply printed that money, which basically means it created it out of thin air. Now, these days, you know, peop uh, central banks really don't print money. They create it digitally. So some entry is made on a computer somewhere, and we have money. And that money... You know, that money needs to be kind of pumped into the financial system. I mean, there is no point in printing money and keeping it in vaults. So, essentially, the, the idea was that, uh, you know, when, when a central bank prints money, it has to pump it into the financial system. Now, how does it pump money into the financial system? Uh, one way of doing it is to load on money onto a helicopter and start kind of dropping it all around. And you would be surprised to know that, you know, a very serious economist, Milton Friedman, who was one of the most famous economists of the 20th century, uh, made that suggestion. I mean, when he was alive, uh, in a different context, not in the context that we are talking about. But uh, obviously, you know, that, that is not possible. And hence, uh, what a central bank typically does is it prints money and then it buys bonds. So when it buys bonds, the money that has been printed goes into the financial system. Now, what is the idea? The idea is to flood this financial system with money so that so much money is going around that interest rates automatically come down. I mean, interest rates ultimately are a function of how much money is available. So once interest rates come down, the hope is that banks will lend more, people will borrow more. Once people borrow more, they'll spend more. They'll buy cars, they'll buy consumer durables, they'll buy homes, so on and so forth. And once that happens, businesses will gain. Businesses will gain means the economy will start doing well all over again. So QED. And I mean, as you would know, this policy came to be known as the first round of quantitative easing. So quantitative easing, you know, it's very, very uh, interesting. Economists call money printing quantitative easing, and uh, central banks call it, uh, you know, buying bonds. So, but essentially they are printing money. Now, the problem was, I mean, this is a line straight out of uh, an ad. I think this was Rin detergent ad in the 1980s and 1990s, where you know one woman tells the other, you know, meri sari tumhari sari se safed kaise. So, now what do I mean? you know, in the, in the context that we are talking about. The context is that once the U.S. was printing money, other central banks thought, you know, we should also start printing money. So, meri sari, tumhari sari se safed kaise? So, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, so, so tumhari, tumhari sari, meri sari se safed kaise? So, soon uh, other central banks were printing money as well. And, you know, the, the irony is, in fact, I was telling this to a senior bureaucrat I was talking to last night, that there is no real estimate of how much money has been printed uh, in the last six to seven years. There are multiple estimates, and the estimates that I have seen vary from anywhere, uh, you know, seven to eight trillion, as you can see on the screen. And I've also seen estimates running to up, uh, as high as 20 trillion dollars. Now, so I just thought that, you know, since we are talking about huge amounts and huger amounts, so let's be a little conservative about it and go with the seven and eight trillion dollar number. Now, just to give you a context of how big uh, this is, if you look at India's GDP, it's around $1.87 trillion. You can round it off to $2 trillion if you want to. And 
So the money printed in the last seven years, 2008 to 2015, six and a half years, is almost four times of India's GDP. You know, that is the massive amount of money that has been printed and flooded into the global financial system. And this, as I said, is a very, very conservative estimate. Now, this can give you a, be you know, a better idea. And this comes from a gentleman called Satyajit Das. He's an Indian Bengali who's, uh, who, who's an Australian citizen and is a world-renowned authority on financial derivatives. His textbooks are standard reference on Wall Street. And Mr. Das says the amount of money injected into the global financial system is sufficient to purchase a large flat screen TV for everyone on the planet. I mean, flat screen TVs, obviously, you know, prices have fallen over the years, but they still don't come very cheap. But the question is, has this money printing succeeded? You know, as, as I explained, the idea was to flood the financial system with money, drive down interest rates, uh, encourage people to borrow and consume more, and in turn hope that economic growth returns. So did that happen? Now, I would like to quote Yogi Berra again. I mean, he is a fantastic guy to quote because he just kind of nails the issue. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. And I would, you know, as, uh, you know, IMA being full of entrepreneurs, you guys would definitely appreciate this. You know, nothing works like experience does. Uh, now, you know, what, what was the problem? Why, why did the theory not work this time around? Because this was not a theory that, you know, uh, evolved in the last 10 years. I mean, it has been around since uh, the Great Depression, which is when the macro macroeconomics as a subject started to come to the forefront. So, you know, an uh, explanation for this entire thing was rather interestingly offered by a Japanese economist called Richard Ku. And he said that both Euro Europe and the US suffer from what he calls a balance sheet depression. Now, what is a balance sheet recession? Sorry, not a depression. Now, uh, you know, before I kind of read out uh, what's written on the screen, uh, you know, Japan in, in the early 80s and uh, uh, in the early 80s basically was going through a stock market bull run and a real estate market bull run. And prices in the real estate market had become so high that if you wanted to buy a house, you needed a 100-year home loan, a home loan which could be repaid over a period of 100 years. Now, obviously, the person taking on the home loan wouldn't have lived so long as to repay it. Hence, the contract was so drawn that his children, and in turn, you know, his children's children would be repaying the loan. So as, as Stephen King, who is uh, a British economist working uh, for HSBC, says, by the end of 1990s, it was not unusual to find Japanese home buyers taking out 100-year mortgages, happy, it seems, to pass the burden on to their children and even to their grandchildren. Now, just to deviate a little here, you know, I live in Bombay, or in, I'm sorry, Mumbai, and uh, in Mumbai, I mean, we all know real estate prices are very, very high. And in fact, I recently kind of came across a research report which said that an average 1,500 square feet uh, flat in Bombay would, cross, uh, would cost around 3 crores. Now, obviously, nobody in Bombay lives in a 1,500 square foot uh, flat, but uh, so we are also getting to a situation where, you know, if we have to buy a home to live in, we, we need at least a 50-year home loan. I mean, not a 100-year home loan, but we have reached a situation where banks need to start giving out 50-year home loans. So coming back uh, to the topic, so the, 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 the bubbles the, in the real estate as well as the stock market started to burst sometime uh, in early 1990. In December 1989, the Bank of Japan, which is the Japanese central bank, started to raise interest rates. Now when you start to raise interest rates, obviously, you know, speculation starts coming down because money becomes costlier. And that punctured both the stock market as well as the real estate uh, bubble in Japan. But the Japanese economy had kind of uh, become so dependent on these bubbles that once these bubbles burst, the Japanese economy also crashed. And the Bank of Japan then had to come to rescue by printing money, using that money to buy bonds, and hoping that interest rates fall and people start consuming all over again. Uh, which is what is happening, which is what happened in, in the last six to seven years. The problem was that the Japanese individuals had already borrowed a lot of money. You know, we are talking about 100-year home loans here. 
so they were trying to repay those loans and they were not in a position to kind of take on more debt so what richard ku says is that you know a similar situation prevails in the western world now which includes the us uh, europe and as well as japan i mean japan is in in major problems these days so people already have a lot of debt and they did not want to borrow more which is what happened in the last which is what what has happened in the last 6 to 7 years but there was still a lot of money available at low interest rates so financial institutions you know working out of wall street and london and zurich and tokyo basically started what came to be known as the dollar carry trade the dollar carry trade is essentially same as what used to be the yen carry trade and you you borrow money at very low interest rates in dollars and then invest that money in financial markets all over the world so this initiated an era of easy money the carry is essentially the difference between the money the interest that you pay on the dollars you borrow and the return that you make on the investment that you make so as i said the money found its way into financial markets all over the world and this is a very interesting uh, point that was recounted to me by a gentleman called gary dugan who works at a very senior position in uh, the royal bank of scotland and what he was trying to tell me is that the money is not going just into financial markets alone it's going into a lot of other places as well so if you look at sotheby's and christies in the art market they are doing extremely well the same is true about the property market places which are in the middle of a jungle in africa their prices have gone up to dollar 100000 an acre why there is no communication no power lines so essentially all this easy money floating around in the global financial system has made it into different asset markets all over the world and you know a lot of that money has also come into the e-commerce market in india you know you see you know flipkarts and the uh, snap deals of the world the funding that is coming in is all coming in from american hedge funds and private equity funds and they in turn are able to borrow money at very very low interest rates so what has been the impact on india and these are very you know i mean i mean i'm sure you would be aware of these numbers but a lot of people find these numbers very very astonishing so the foreign institutional investors have brought in close to 3 lakh 23970 crores into india in the last 6 years okay uh, and this money has come into the stock market and you know obviously they've bought stocks now compare this to what our own investors you know domestic institutional investors which are basically the you know which are lic and all the mutual funds and all the insurance companies so they have sold stocks worth, worth around 1 lakh 28000 crores in the last 6 years so the point i'm trying to make is that the indian stock market is essentially driven by foreign investors you know you may watch cnbc all day and they'll give you logic about how earnings are improving and how profits are improving and you know this looks like a good business and so on and so forth but the point is you know at the end of the day unless foreign money comes in the stock market is not going anywhere i mean it goes up only when the foreign money comes in and the other thing i would like to say here is that you you know you have to be very very careful with what indian institutional investors say in the public domain because of the simple fact you know they may they may publicly say that they are bullish on india but the numbers don't say that you know if they were bullish on india they would be buying indian stocks which they are not uh other than that you know fis have always also invested close to 2 lakh 76000 crores in the debt market so this money has gone into government bonds and it has also gone into private bonds a lot of this money has come in over the last one and a half years i mean close to 2 lakh 42 43000 crores has come in only in the last one and a half years so <clears throat> obviously you know we all want to know what happens next i mean that is what you know the original disclaimer that i had given uh so as sharukh khan often says in a lot of his lousy movies a picture abhi baki hai so you know the, the this thing is still playing out and it will keep playing out uh but the points that we need to remember over here is is that in october 2014 Uh, the federal reserve of united states led by janet yellen decided to stop printing any more money so the us federal reserve is not printing uh, any more money they have printed around 4 trillion dollars by now 
Uh, at the same time, you know, they said that they, they are not printing any more money, but they said that they will not withdraw all the money that they have printed and pumped into the financial system. So what that does is, in turn, that it keeps interest rates low because all that money that has been printed and pumped is still into the financial system. And which essentially means that the carry trade where you borrow in dollars and invest in financial markets all over the world continues. So the carry trade has not stopped because the interest rates are still very, very low. Uh, interestingly, you know, in January 2015, Janet Yellen suggested, and I'll explain why I use the word suggested, uh, that uh, the Federal Reserve will start raising interest rates sometime later this year. And, you know, most analysts seem to think that what she was saying was that the Federal Reserve will start raising interest rates by April 2015. Uh, you know, we had Dr. Bimal Jalan over here, and uh, I'm sure he would appreciate that Central bank governors don't al always speak very, very clearly. Uh, Raghuram Rajan is an exception. He speaks very, very clearly. He never, you know, he says only what he really means. And so this is a quote uh, from Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve of United States for close to 18 years between 1988 and 2006. And uh, so, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. So, uh, Mr. Greenspan was a master of, uh, you know, confusing everybody. So, and in, in the end, he got confused himself. So, <laughs> uh, now the interesting thing is, you know, what will happen to all the money that has come into India? I mean, I think this is a very important issue if uh, the Indian economy has to continue to do well in in the years to come. I mean. Uh, I mean, right now there is a debate on as to whether the Indian economy is doing well or it's not doing well or whether the Modi government has had any impact or it has not had any impact. So, I mean, that will become clear in the days to come. But if this money that has come in starts to go out, we will have a major economic headache coming in the days to come. Uh, something like that happened in May 2013 when Ben Bernanke, I mean, uh, he mildly suggested that uh, the Federal Reserve would start raising interest rates. And that created havoc all across uh, the world. And in India, what happened was close to 78,000 crores uh, of money left the debt market. Now, obviously, you know, when these foreign investors uh, sell out, they get paid rupees. They try to convert those rupees into dollars. So when they try to convert rupees into dollars, obviously the demand for the dollar goes up and the value of the rupee starts to fall against uh, the dollar. And I mean, I'm sure all of you would remember that the rupee almost touched 69 to a dollar. And, you know, people even said that now it will go to 100 and things like that. But that did not happen because uh, the Reserve Bank of India started to intervene and Raghuram Rajan was uh, pushed into uh, the Reserve Bank, I think, two weeks uh, earlier than he was supposed to take over as officer on special duty. And he, in turn, kind of saved the day for us. Now, the question is, will something similar happen this time around as well? Uh, this is not a very easy, straightforward question to answer. And uh, so I'll just make a couple of points which I think will have an impact. Now, uh, even though the Federal Reserve Bank has stopped printing money, the European Central Bank recently decided, uh, much to a lot of opposition from Germany, that it will start printing money. So the European Central Bank uh, has plans of printing money uh, close to 1.1 trillion euros up to September 2016. Uh, the Bank of Japan is also printing money right now uh, under uh, what is being called as Abenomics uh, in reference to the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And uh, so the Bank of Japan is printing around close to, I think, uh, they started printing sometime in early 2013. And by April 2015, they would have printed around $1.5 trillion. I mean, obviously, you know, the equivalent in yen. They don't print dollars. So the, the question is, you know, uh, you know the, the, the money from the U.S. may start to go out. But will that be replaced by money coming in from Europe? and money coming in from Japan. In fact, you know, uh, some of my institutional contacts tell me that money from Japan and money from Europe has already started to come in. And we now have, after the yen carry trade and the dollar carry trade, we have the euro carry trade. So uh, that's one part. 
the other part, interesting part, is that oil prices have crashed. I mean, much to the surprise of uh, everyone, uh, oil prices have crashed, and uh, that will play a major role. I mean, the way, uh, which way oil prices go will play a major role in deciding whether the US Federal Reserve starts to raise interest rates or not. Now, why do I say that? I say that primarily because in the last six years, since 2008, the United States has discovered something called as shale oil. And they have uh, increased their production to close to 9 million barrels per day. And uh, to give you a sense of comparison, Saudi Arabia only produces 10 million barrels per day. So the US is producing as much oil as Saudi Arabia does. Okay? And all of this increase in production of close to 4 million barrels per day has come from shale oil. The problem is that shale oil is very expensive to produce. It is not viable at current prices. Uh, for shale oil to be viable, uh, oil prices need to be you know, anywhere between $55 uh, per barrel to $70 per barrel. Uh, the thing that has happened in the US uh, in the last six years is that uh, because of shale oil, a lot of jobs are being created. Uh, close to 30% of the jobs that are being created right now are being created by shale oil companies. So if shale oil companies start to go bankrupt, you know, there is a great chance of that happening if oil prices continue to be lower than $50 a barrel, then the U.S. economic recovery will come to a standstill. You know, the U.S. Uh, grew by, uh, I think they grew by 5% in one of those, in, in the September quarter. And that economic recovery will come to a standstill and if the economic recovery comes to a standstill, the U.S. Federal Reserve cannot raise interest rates. I mean, that is Central Banking 101. Uh, also, you know, we need to remember that we have uh, Raghuram Rajan at the RBI. I mean, the media tends to refer to him as rock star, thanks to Shobhade, who wrote a piece on him once he took over. So, you know, that is the way I, you know, as far as I can see right now, and, you know, in the end, I mean, I, I started with uh, Sivaji Rao Gaikwad, and I would like to end with Sivaji Rao Gaikwad as well. Uh, in the end, as always, for all the wisdom, we go back to this former bus conductor called Shivaji Rao Gaikwad. And why I am saying this is, you know, Rajni Kant is, is a phenomenon who people who live, uh, you know, to the north of the Vindhyas, and people who live in East India, people who live in West India, they don't seem to understand. You know, why is this guy such a superstar? And this is not to say that people in the south of India understand why Rajnikant is a superstar. They also don't understand why Rajnikant is a superstar. So, the point I'm trying to make is that Rajnikant is another proof that not everything can be analyzed just because there is something called analysis. And, you know, the global financial crisis is becoming more and more like that. There are so many factors at play, you know, at, and, and, you know, so many of these things are causal, what, you know, cause, causes an effect and the effect causes the cause. So you simply cannot uh, analyze it beyond a point and you have to just kind of wait for things to happen and then react to it. And the trick is obviously to react quickly, which is what the RBI did in September 2013 and I, you know, I, I am sure that if and when something happens, uh, they'll do it again. Thank you.